Well, hello, Woodman. My name is Lauren, and I am excited to worship with you today. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We are so happy you are here. And whether it is your first time or you've been with Woodman for a while, but might just be looking for some new things to get connected in, we have opportunities for you. If you are in your 20s, join us this Thursday night for Third Thursday. It's going to be a night full of worship, teaching, and just a relaxed environment to meet other 20-somethings in the same life stage as you. So join us this Thursday, January 20th at 7 p.m. in our Rock Rimmon Worship Center. Another opportunity for us all to get connected is through community groups. We have community groups meeting in different homes throughout the Pikes Peak region. And this gives us an opportunity to grow deeper in our faith and to connect with other folks who call Woodman their home. So new groups are forming right now. So it's a great opportunity to sign up for one. Something else to get on your radar is our Woodman U classes. It's a selection of classes that meet Monday nights, and there's different classes that can help you grow in your knowledge about the Bible and grow deeper in your faith. There's other classes that if you are walking through a tough season, we want to come alongside you in that. So for more information on Woodman U, Third Thursday, and community groups, visit our online service guide. Now let's prepare our hearts as we are about to worship our God who is faithful. Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls to my fear, I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then, you be faithful now. I'm standing on. Giants fall. You 
Well, hello, Woodman. Uh, if you're joining us online or if you are here with us in person at one of our campuses, thank you for being with us today. We are so glad uh, you've taken this time to join us. Uh, when I was, um, I was about 13 years old, and my father uh, was picking me up. I, I actually think it was from student ministry. And I got in the front seat, and we hadn't even gotten that far from the church. We were still in the neighborhood. Uh, when I leaned over, and I changed the radio station to 102.1 The Edge. Now, that was the, uh, the alternative rock station, which in hindsight, looking back, like if alternative rock is over here, uh, Beige on Beige, my father, is, is the exact opposite. And he pulled the car over, and he came to a stop, and he looked at me, and he said, I'm sorry, is this your car? <laughs> A am I driving your car? And I sheepishly, no. And he said, well, how about this? Uh, when I'm driving my car, I'll get to pick the station. When you drive yours, that's your opportunity. Now, at the time, I acted like the indignant little teenager. I mean, I could not believe my father was so uncool to want to not listen to something, you know, made in the last decade. However, in time, and let's just pick now, when I have like three teenage sons of my own, as an example, now I do appreciate the, the my car, my station, and, and all of its various iterations line of thought. I mean, if you're a parent, ha have you ever used the same logic? My house, my right? Have you ever had to throw down that as long as I'm paying for that cell phone, I'll pick when you use it. If I'm making dinner, that is what we're serving. That is what you're eating. Now, if you're a parent and you've ever done that, or even if you're not a parent, but, but it actually does make some sense, you should have no problem understanding our text today. Last week... Uh, we began a new series entitled 10 Words to Live By, looking at the Ten Commandments, or what the Israelites referred to as the Ten Words. And, and today, uh, we come to the second one, uh, which is pretty much because he is the God who made us, he gets to choose how we worship him. Because he's the God who made us, he gets to choose how we worship him. I mean, if we think it's like an inalienable right to get to choose what we eat for dinner on our birthdays, certainly the sovereign God of the universe gets to decide how his children worship him. That makes sense to you. If not, my prayer is that God will use our time in the Word today to uh, change your heart, to help us understand together. So if you would, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, as we said last week, when we, when we begin to talk about you, you commanding us, you, you having expectations, you wanting us to do something, uh, you know that the proclivities of our heart is to chafe at that. I guess speaking only for myself, I often want to do the things I want to do. Lord, I pray that you would help us learn. I pray that you would help us understand. And in doing so, knit our hearts closer to yours. Father, I pray that you would help me right now. 
Uh, For some, we've heard this stuff all the time. For others, this might be the first time in a long time that we find ourselves here. And so, God, I pray that your spirit would be present. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 20, and we're at verse 4. And I guess I'll just do a little disclaimer. If you kind of grew up Catholic or Lutheran, it might Twitch you out a little bit. What we call commandments one and two, Catholics and Lutherans actually just kind of put as one. And then they take the tenth one and they split that into two. So for us, uh, the the second commandment begins at verse four. And this is it. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. So the first commandment in verse 3 is you shall have no other gods before me. The second one is you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Now, as I say, some people are like, well, those got to be the same thing. And they sound similar, but to us, it's, they're actually quite different. See, the first word talks about who, who we are to worship, and it's God and God alone. The second commandment gets at not who, but how we are to worship God and God alone. Rather pointedly, Unlike the majority of the nations around them, certainly different from Egypt from which they just came, the Israelites were to have no idols. Now, that is no carved images of anything that they worship. And God lays it out. Nothing in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or the sea below. (laughs) You can almost see, right? Moses having to feel the questions, where, yes, like, could I, I just want to have the the big dipper. No, see, that's above. Over there, just a lion. It's a statue. Nope. Jimmy, what about a seahorse? No, see, no images, no images of anything. No likenesses of anything. Now, you maybe just put it away so before you get all convicted, you don't have to go home and like burn your nativity set. That, 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 that's not what we are talking about here. Uh, see, the big qualifier is that beginning of verse 5, right? It, it, the images or the likenesses, the issue was they could not bow down or serve them. See, in a lot of those false religions, they understood those idols as like a gateway to, to the God himself. That's why they would, they would make their offerings. They would put the things before the idol, understanding that idol directly taking that to the God. This is saying, no, that you cannot do. The issue, the issue was worshiping the created thing in the name of God. So later, it was actually not inconsistent at all when God had them add some angels to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Say, well, that's an image of something above. Yes, but nobody ever worshiped them or the Ark. It wasn't a fixture of worship, and in that case, it was fine. And it didn't matter that many of the religions around them were using idols to practice their faith. When worshiping me, God says, you're not going to do that. Turns out, uh, for the Israelites, this one was easier said than done. And it's actually sort of embarrassing. If you were to Go ahead, four chapters to Exodus 24, verse, uh, Exodus 24, rather. M- Moses comes, comes down from the mountain. And as we said last week, remember, all, all the Israelites heard the voice of God. It, it actually freaked them out. So they all knew what the ten words were. And, and, and Moses essentially says to him, so 
What's it going to be? <laughs> you, you've heard what he's asked. And in verse 7, they all reply, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. It was like thumbs up all around. Everybody in, we're in, we're in, we're in. And then God, God has like part B. And so he's like, hey, Moses, come on back up. And, and, and God gives him more details here, specifically the tabernacle, some of the stuff he had to make. He's taking lots of notes. But Moses is up there for 40 days and 40 nights. It, it's, it's, to be fair, it's a while. But they had just heard the very voice of God and thumbed up all of it. We're in. You know what they go and do is the people get restless. They get, they get tired of waiting. And so they go to Aaron and they ask, would you make us an idol? Which you would like to have thought that somebody in the organization is, what, the, <laughs> what are you talking about? We're not even far down the list. And Aaron does that. He collects all their gold. He fashions for them a little golden calf. And he builds an altar before it. And you read in verse 32, chapter, uh, chapter 32, verse 5, that Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. All caps. Aaron uses the right name for God. So when all the Israelites came and, and, and worshipped around the golden calf, it was not the first commandment they were breaking. Aaron said, we're going to have a feast to the Lord, to the, to the right one. The who, they had right. The how, they had very wrong. And it may not seem like much to you. But God was ready to destroy them for it. And Moses interceded, and God relented. And what can be lost on us is that living, living on this side of the cross, it is easy to forget that the, the following after Jesus, there, there, are, there are expectations inherent in that relationship too. Uh, this is not some free-form jazz exploration that we're all wondering and dreaming about going our own way. Jesus has thoughts. Jesus has expectations. Jesus would actually say in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him or her deny himself take up their cross and follow me. Uh, you will not necessarily get to choose. There are things you're going to want to do that I will say no. There's things you're going to not want to, places you will not want to go, and I will say come, and you must be ready to actually physically die. While few of us, I imagine, have any literal idols in our home, the second commandment, the second word, is still rather weighty. We do not get to choose how we worship him. He sets the terms. Uh, the most important being the gospel. Uh, we, we must confess him as Lord and, and acknowledge our sin before him. 
Uh, We need to believe that God put on flesh, Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived the life we couldn't live, died upon the cross, was buried, and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. We, We must come to him on a bended knee that says, you are God, I am not. You are perfect, I have not been. And I recognize that we probably all know people who are like, but I think there's other ways to God. I see this happening, and I think that this person has a great point. God gets to choose. And there's only one name under heaven by which people can be saved, and it's Jesus Christ. God goes on to give some justification for this command. Look at the mid part there of verse 5. It says, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Now, in English, this is tough uh, because in English, jealousy is is almost always, you know, know, a negative. Uh, You have something I don't have. I, I want it. I am jealous of you. And it's not a good quality, it's never an admirable one. But here, here though, God is using this word, and it's the best one we've got in English. Zeal comes close, but not quite. God is using this word jealous of himself in a positive way. And the best example that almost all commentators point to is, is the jealousy that should exist between a husband and his wife. There should be some jealousy there. I do not want my wife to kiss other guys. That would have, that's like, amen. That's, we don't, we're not an amen church, but that's, <laughs> I don't want my wife to kiss other guys. Amen, amen right? You, you maybe don't even know her, And you're like, that makes sense. None of you are getting in the car later and saying to somebody, I had no idea he was so intolerant. (laughs) Just him? (sighs) That's ridiculous. The issue, it's a matter of his exclusiveness. Kimberly and I have an exclusive relationship. And, and if someone tries to step to that, I rightly get upset. And actually, the absence of any sort of guttural reaction to someone trying to do that would in and of itself be a problem. To not care, to not be jealousy, then you would get in the car and say, something is not right. The same, the same is true of God. God is jealous of us in a good way, and consequently desires to protect the exclusiveness of what should be our relationship with him. God is jealous when you or I place our affections elsewhere which clearly would preclude us from bowing down and worshiping some idol that we fashioned with our own hands. You can appreciate that that would fire him up, right? But there's actually more to it than that. And and we did this last week. We'll do like a a little little sidebar as as we unpack. Part of the thing that's easy to gloss over 
right? Is that God has actually already made something in his image. And who's that? It's us. God made us, male and female, in his image. Those words, image and likeness, that that are found in the second commandment, that's not the first time that God put those words together. Back in Genesis chapter 1, you're not even far into the book, chapter 1, verse 26, as God talks about creating us, he used those two very same words there. You and I are image bearers of God. We bear the likeness of the God who created us. As such, we should not be worshiping the created. We are to solely worship our creator. Because anything else is a very, very poor substitute. Which is why, if, if you're new to this stuff and, and you've wondered about it, but, but it's why this weekend is, is so special to many of us. And why I think it's particularly awesome that this passage just happened to land on this weekend. Uh, We have what we call Sanctity of Life Sunday. And and then we have Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday. And we, we are staunchly supportive of both. Why? Because we believe every person regardless of the color of their skin, whether they are currently residing in utero, or whether they are super, super, super old and people think not much help to society. All people in between, and and every color that could be contained therein, each and every one bears the image of God who made them and is a picture of his likeness in the world. As such, nobody should take away their lives or discriminate against them because we are the image and likeness of God and as such have worth that no other created being has. God, God is jealous of us in a unique way. Now, is that to say God doesn't care about the deer that prance around and look so cute? Is that to say that God isn't like, you know, interested in dolphins, doesn't care about cats, but does he, does it to say that God isn't mindful of every sparrow that falls from the sky? He absolutely is. But he's jealous of you. He made you in his image. He's jealous of us. Are you, are you jealous to protect your exclusive? relationship with him. Does does it matter to you? Because the decision is yours, but it's it's not one without consequences. Uh, let, let's, let's start from verse 4 just one more time. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, I will say this is a widely misunderstood bit of Scripture, and it's one that's terrifying. And I will tell you, even if you understand it rightly, (laughs) it's still very much sobering. And if you unpack it, there's both a positive and a negative here, right? There's, there's, a, there's a warning and a pledge. Uh, what's, what's the warning? I'm going to visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. The warning is, if you do bow down to idols, Israelites, if you persist... In worshiping me in that way, I will visit that iniquity, your iniquity, to the third and fourth generation. God's saying, your great-grandchildren potentially will be paying the price. That's heavy. But then there's also a pledge. However, I show steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The pledge is that he will show steadfast love to thousands, that is to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep his commandments. So to unpack both, the warning, what what isn't it? What what it isn't? What, What is God not saying here? So this is not to say that, that if, your, if your grandfather used to steal pierogies every Saturday in the old country, that God is going to punish you today for that sin. That, that, is, not, that is not what this is saying. Actually, Ezekiel 18.20 explicitly tells us that that is not what God means here because there it says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. Uh, We are not liable for the sins of our parents. And to be clear, if you look at the second commandment, the warning is not tied to some like one-off or, or petty sin. Not that we would say any sin's petty, but the stealing the pierogies seems a bit much to go after the great-grandson for it, right? No, the, the, God is quite explicit. It, it's tied to those who, what is the word God uses? Hate him. For those who hate him. And so that is, those who have been told, those who have heard the voice of God booming from on top of the mountain. Do not worship me through idols. And they say, no. That's still going to be a part of my life. And it could be for any reason. right? It, It could be that literally every nation around them did that. It could be that every nation around them had a plurality of gods. They had national gods, which every Jew, no matter how deprived they would get into their future, every single Israelite would always say, the name of the Lord is Yahweh. Like, we know that. But we also have this one and that one. This is kind of a family deal. This is my own personal one. And I know God, I just meet with God in this way. God's like, don't do that. The promise, however, it is immensely better, right? Because rather than being a promise that extends only to the third or fourth generation, this pledge extends to the thousandth 
It's like your, your greatest number difference in the Bible. Like, to those who hate me, I'm going 3-4, but to those who love me, I'm going a thousand generations down. And who's that for? For those who love him and keep his commands. They are helping in doing so to see future, future generations blessed. You may not even be a follower of Christ, but a lot of us have seen uh, the sins of a father, sins of a mother. They have a way of making it down the family tree, don't they? I mean, if you worship God back then in the way that God didn't want, but in a way that you presented normative to your children, even invoking the name of God in your idolatrous forms of worshiping him, Your children could very well follow in the example that you set, and they'll suffer the consequences for it. It's weighty. Now, as we said, chances are few of us have physical idols that we think gain us access to God and and are actively at home teaching our children to not only come to church but also to bow down to those fake gods. But we can be tempted to worship God in ways that are not what he's asked. And kids watch. I mean, you think of Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount. Just, just. And even then, just a part of it, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, do not store up treasures in heaven. Uh, Do not store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. Do your children see in you those four displayed in the same way that Jesus does? Three being positive, one being negative. Even, Even just the one when you give. Do not give as those who like to be seen by others. But your father who sees in secret, give in secret, so he sees and not others. I've had conversations with people who are like, "I, I don't, I don't give. I, I, I think that, you know, it's kind of a thing that the church is all about money. And I, I can do better with my money than giving it to the church or to other organizations. Like, that's, that's not for me. Or, or it's like, well, we don't give now. And we want to, like, really establish, you know, some stuff in the hopes that one day we'll be able to. Well, the plan is to give, but it's just not now. And really, it's just different than Jesus assumes we worship. He's like, when you give, he's assuming we do, and then lays out a how that's to happen, as he does with prayer, as he does with fasting, as he talks about material possessions and their worth. But do we see those the same? Or do we kind of pick and choose? You think of Hebrews, the author there, Hebrews 10, 25, how often did this come up during those pandemic days? You know, do not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some. But there are followers of Christ. They they, they tell me and and they say, I I don't need to go to church uh, to be a Christian. That's, that's not, you know, the way I express my faith with Jesus, the way I commune with him, I mean, it's just better on a mountainside without you. 
Now, the problem is that Jesus doesn't call us to that. Jesus desires for us to be part of, of his body, the church. There just isn't an option unless you're going to go your own way. You think of the Apostle Paul, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. That is your worship. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Called to worship by offering ourselves up a living sacrifice. But I will say, not to step on toes, I have never in my years and years of being a pastor heard so much about people's individual rights as of late. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But he does bid us to follow him. And he has a pretty particular path he'd like us to stick to. And any time we hear of what Jesus has called us to and say, you know what, on that one, thanks, no thanks, I'm going to do this. You could be breaking the second commandment. Might that apply to you? And the thing is, our sin, our pattern of life still does affect our children and the generations that come after us. And it is amazing to hear the prayers, heartfelt, I believe. I, the most important thing I want for my kid is for them to follow after Jesus Christ. And the best thing you can humanly do to make that happen is to earnestly follow after Jesus Christ yourself. If, if you don't care about giving and, and want to store up your treasures here on earth, it's not a recipe for raising generous children. And if you come to church when there's literally nothing else awesome to do on a weekend, that doesn't really breed a ton of commitment in the hearts of your kids that are looking at you. And if they really think from what they hear, not what you say in public, but what you say in the car, or maybe what you say around the kitchen table when you think no one's listening, that the most important person is you and people need to see it and your rights matter. They may not quite grasp the concept of a living sacrifice. That is, to be our spiritual worship. Are you teaching your children to worship God as he's asked to be worshipped? Or are you teaching them something else? Are you worshipping God in the way he's asked you to? And if not, Maybe today, you make a little adjustment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's weighty, and, and yet, I'm so stubborn to see it. I can read through the Old Testament and find myself scoffing at these Israelites who keep turning to idolatry, to their own hurt, and wonder, what is their problem? And then I, too, God, go to seek to worship you in ways 
that you've told me not to. So God, meet with us now. May we have no other gods before you, certainly. But would we worship you in the way that you've asked? In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. And that phrase that we, we sang, is he worthy? He is. And he is worthy of all of our worship, all of our praise, all of our life, whether our circumstances may be good and it seems as if the shun, sun is shining on us, he is worthy of our praise and our worship when our circumstances are difficult and it seems as if there is darkness. But Christ has come, he has brought light, and he is worthy. And if we can come alongside, if we can pray with you, if we can support you in any way, you're facing a, a relationship issue, a financial issue, whatever it may be, let us know. Here, we're going to have folks up front after the service. If you're with us online, reach out to us. Send us an email. Let us know. It would be our honor, our privilege to come alongside, to pray with you, to remind you that no matter what you're facing, He is worthy. Know that we love you, that we're for you. But as you go, as you prepare to head into your Saturday, let me read these words over you. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.